Our next speaker today is Dr. Mary Klotman. Dr. Klotman is the R.J. Reynolds Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine at Duke University School of Medicine. She earned her undergraduate and medical degrees from Duke and then completed her internal medicine residency and fellowship in infectious diseases in the Department of Medicine at Duke. She subsequently moved to the National Institutes of Health where she was a member of the Public Health Service and trained and worked in the laboratory of tumor cell biology under the direction of Bob Gallo. Dr. Klotman joined the faculty at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, where she was a tenured professor of medicine and microbiology and held the Irene and Dr. Arthur M. Fishberg Chair in Infectious Diseases, overseeing the translational research program in HIV pathogenesis. She also served as chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases for 13 years and co-director of Mount Sinai's Global Health and Emerging Pathogens Institute. She then returned to Duke in March of 2010 to become chair of the Department of Medicine. Dr. Klotman's research is focused on the molecular pathogenesis of HIV-1 infection. Among many important contributions to the field, Dr. Klotman and her collaborators demonstrated that HIV resides in and evolves separately in kidney cells and infects these cells via direct contact with infected T cells. Dr. Klotman is a member of and on the council of the AAP and currently serves as an associate editor of the JCI and the Annual Reviews of Medicine. We are very fortunate that Dr. Klotman is here today as a speaker sponsored by the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Dr. Klotman. Thank you, and I'm so honored to be the APSA plenary speaker. Um, they asked me to do something that I don't think I can accomplish in a short period of time, which is talk about my science, my career, you've already heard it, um, and then the physician scientists in the 21st century. So struggling with that task, um, I thought I'd tell you a story, and that's the story of working on a team. Because if I think about what is one of the pathways to success going forward, it's certainly going to be team science. We say that a lot, um, but I really have benefited from being part of a, a really marvelous team of investigators. So this is the story of a team, and it's a team that addressed a clinical problem into, although I can't say it quite as eloquently, it is the integration of clinical observation that does drive um, research. And I, I know people don't like the word translation, and maybe we shouldn't call it that, but it certainly has framed a lot of the work that we've done in this disease. Sue? So. Yep, we'll get it. Can't quite get it going forward here. Okay. Um, so the research team. This was a team that we assembled when we were at Mount Sinai. Um, we've kind of had a spreading across the country. Um, I'm at Duke now. My husband's at Baylor. He started this whole program, and we still have a, a wonderful group of uh, collaborators at Mount Sinai, but we've had investigators and collaborators at Yale and Columbia. A whole mix of science uh, represented in our team, and that's really been very important in studying this disease, cell biology, molecular biology, virology, genetics, um, and most importantly, really astute clinical investigators um, run by uh, Christina Wyatt, who constantly reframes the questions for us by, by making important clinical observations. And then, of course, core support that's allowed us to do animal work and human work, um, and lately to have a really, really um, high quality informatics core for analysis of a lot of data that then drives our research. So a great team. Um, just to talk a little bit about career development, since APSA invited me to speak, um, this PPG, which is now in its 14th year, I'm very proud of that, um, funded by NIDDK, really has been not only great for advancing the science, but also for career development. And in fact, we, we were trying to count how many trainees, too numerous to count, um, future MDs and PhDs, but certainly three MSTP students who we really felt were part of our family as they were getting their degrees, three NSF awards, in seven K awardees, now five of them are independently funded, so you can succeed and become independently funded, and two are division chiefs. Um, so that's as much fun as the science. In terms of the science, we started this project addressing what was a very important um, clinical uh, problem. That was the observation very early in the AIDS epidemic that patients were presenting with very rapidly progressive renal failure, and in fact, in some urban settings, it was as high as 10 percent of the patient population. All of the patients were of African descent. They had nephrotic range proteinuria, 
At first, people thought maybe it was due to IV drug use, but this was clearly different from IV drug use. In fact, only half had a history. Um, and the renal disease was very rapidly progressive, so starting off with what we thought was a very important problem. Um, it became known as HIV nephropathy, um, became the most common cause of chronic renal failure in HIV seropositive um, black patients in the U.S. pre-antiretroviral therapy. And again, the observation over and over again that it, it occurs worldwide almost exclusively in blacks, clearly suggesting a strong genetic component. Then a subsequent observation that antiretroviral therapy altered the disease but didn't actually it decrease um, the incidence of end-stage renal disease, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And we think it's probably at least a variant of HIV-associated kidney disease, whether it's high van, is widespread in Africa, although we don't have biopsy, extensive biopsy series in, in studies screening for proteinuria in some areas, particularly of West Africa, where some of the the risk allele for the disease, which we now know is up to 36% of the patients can have proteinuria. So we think this is going to be a significant issue as we improve longevity in, in patients in Africa. And then we now know that HIV contributes to non in chronic kidney disease, which is going to be another very interesting story. So in this disease, we really allowed the clinical observations to drive our work. So what was the role of the virus, particularly in an organ that is not an immune organ? and where we thought the target of the disease was not immune cells, although the disease was appearing in, in patients with end-stage AIDS. So which cell was involved? Which viral genes really drove the disease? How did the virus get there in this unique um, organ? And what were the pathogenic pathways that might inform therapy? And then certainly going after the genetic contribution. And then more recently, again, going back to the clinical observation, what was driving the change in clinical presentation from a what's called high van to an increase in non-classical high van and chronic kidney disease of other causes. So our approach to pathogenesis has been iterative. We've developed um, primary and transformed cell culture models representing renal tubal epithelial cells and podocytes. Very fortunate to be able to use transgenic modeling in HIV. This is the only disease manifestation of HIV that you can use uh, murine transgenic modeling without humanizing um, the mouse. Um, we have developed a very important human cohort uh, through biobanking and a, a, a clinical uh, registry, and then developing large omic database, databases now that, that really allow us to generate new hypotheses. So this is the disease as it presented in the 80s and early 90s, and it was really a, a diagnosis made by biopsy. Um, gross findings for large echogenic kidneys, um, but on microscopy, these tubular, uh, this microcystic tubular dilatation, collapsing FSGS, and the collapse was very unique, um, leukocyte infiltration in the interstitium, uh, eventually interstitial fibrosis, and epithelial cell proliferation. And so as I, as I mentioned, we were fortunate that if you take an HIV transgene, and in this case, Gagpol deleted, because at the time this was created by Peter Dickey, there was a fear that the virus could replicate in mice, and that, that was going to be a little hard to contain. We now know it cannot. But anyway, it was Gagpol deleted, and when you put this in the transgenic, when you make transgenic mice, um, several lines developed what pathologically looked fairly identical to uh, the human disease. And this line is TG26. This is one of the lines that survived. Some of them did not. Um, and you can see both of the glomerulus as well as in, in the tubular interstitium, the disease looks identical. So we've been able to use this mouse to really explore hypotheses about the disease. So some of that I don't want to, to go into detail of a large body of work, but some of the critical observations that came from the transgenic animal modeling was, first of all, that expression of HIV as a transgene recreated the disease pathologically, and many transgenic models, including in the rat, have, have done that as well. But uh, most importantly, renal disease was dependent on intrarenal expression. And that was really nailed by a very elegant reciprocal transplantation uh, experiment done by Leslie Brueggemann in the lab at the time that really showed that the disease really traveled with having the transgene in the kidney, not having the transgene in the mouse where you transplant in a normal kidney. So that really led us to 
go back and look at kidneys very carefully because we couldn't find the virus initially, but also taught us that you lose RNA if you don't process the biopsies rapidly. So literally going into the biopsy suite, getting the, the tissue, um, we were able to really show where the virus is. And then um, in subsequent experiments, being able to use the transgenic model to look at the direct role of specific viral proteins in a large body of work done by C. Zhang He, who is here, and, and in Paul Klotman's lab, they were really able to show that the NEF gene is responsible for many of the podocyte dysfunction. And in my lab, we were able to show that the VPR gene is responsible for much of the tubule epithelial cell dysfunction. So I'm going to just go through some of the VPR story because this was done by um, our MSTP student, Paul Rosenstiel, who um, is now a pathology resident at Columbia. But he was able to show that if you express VPR in renal tubule epithelial cells, you get G2 arrest, which had been known to be associated with VPR expression. You get initiation of DNA repair pathway, which again had been known. You get apoptosis, um, and that can be that actually progresses over time. And then kind of a unique observation is you also get polyploidy. And this observation really has, has led us to ask the question, is that a survival response? And we think it might be, and that's ongoing work currently. But we were able to show that VPR expression in itself does that and also changes the phenotype of the cell. And they become quite enlarged. And in fact, if you go back and look in the mouse model um, on the right, uh, on your, your right? Um, you see large hypertrophied epithelial cells, and actually they're multinucleated. And so when we look at the kidney biopsies from humans, we also see these large hypertrophied cells. Again, they appear to be multinucleated. And when Paul went and did chromosomal in situ hybridization on the human biopsies, we could show that, in fact, many of them were polyploid. And this was a new recognition of, of a feature of this disease. And interestingly, um, this was the first time we could ever demonstrate an impact of this gene on the human disease. We knew it did a lot of interesting things in the lab, but it actually is responsible for the pathology in the epithelial cell. And in fact, if you look at evidence of a DNA repair pathway activation, you also see that in both transgenic mice and in humans. So getting back to um, how the virus gets in the kidney, as I mentioned, the transgenic mouse really taught us how to process kidney biopsies to go back and look for the RNA. And sure enough, when we did that, you can see really dramatic evidence of HIV infection of both the glomerular epithelial cells, both visceral podocytes here and parietal, po or parietal podocytes and visceral podocytes. And then when you look in the epithelial, the tubule epithelial cells, again, you see dramatic infection of renal tubule epithelial cells. And the other observation is that when one cell gets infected, the whole tubule gets infected, suggesting that there is perhaps cell-to-cell -cell spread within the kidney. The other um, observation in this published series is that although many of the patients we had an opportunity to look at had high van and were from, of African-American origin, that some of them were Caucasian and didn't have high van. They had other diseases, and yet they still had virus in the kidney, suggesting that although the virus is required, it is not enough to, to cause high van. And the other observation that's really driven a lot of our work is this really impressive interstitial inflammatory response chocked full of cells carrying HIV. Now, um, I had an, I had an opportunity uh, when I was covering one evening to actually take my research uh, very dramatically to the clinic because we had a patient present one evening from the emergency room with a diagnosis of presumptive Hodgkin's. Now, you would think being in New York in the 1990s, that might not be the first thing to come to mind, but his adenopathy was so profound, he didn't give a history of HIV. We got the history of a really impressive sexual uh, activity, and in fact, this gentleman had HIV, and he had a very dramatic presentation of renal disease. So he had grams of protein, he had rapidly progressive renal failure, we did a biopsy when he presented, and he had the classic findings, he also had kind of loss of synaptopotent staining, which had already been identified by our collaborator, Vivette Degatti, as a marker of dedifferentiation that's seen in this disease. And we had the, the unique opportunity to biopsy this patient on IRB um, protocol 
once he initiated therapy, and he had a dramatic response to therapy. Viral load plummeted, and within a month, his creatinine was almost down to normal. Uh, he, he had no longer any evidence of proteinuria, and in fact, many of the classic findings of Hyvan had disappeared on biopsy, and he had recovery of synaptopodin staining. That was very gratifying. So we had another observation that, in retrospect, is not surprising, but is a little unsettling, which is if you look for viral RNA pre- and post-therapy, he still had a lot of viral RNA in his kidneys. Why? Because many of the kidney cells don't die, and if they don't die, antiretrovirals have no effect on that cell. Um, and in fact, some of the cells were still expressing viral protein, but what had gone away was that very uh, brisk interstitial inflammatory response. So remember this when I talk about some of the issues that we really are concerned about today. But from the clinical um, studies with, the, with in situ hybridization, we really could show that HIV infected renal epithelial cells and that there was this, this interstitial infiltration. That really led us to hypothesize that maybe the way that the virus gets in these very unusual cells, they do not have HIV receptor or co-receptor, maybe it is through a, a cell synapse between the T cell and the renal epithelial cell. Um, and in fact, once it enters, perhaps it goes from cell to cell. And I'll show you the work that really has, has shown that that indeed is the case. We also noted that viral nucleic acid was in people without Hyvan and Caucasians, again suggesting there was more to the, the, the disease than just having the virus. There had to be a genetic predisposition. And in fact, um, there has never been a clinical trial for this disease because as we were making the observation in the lab uh, relative to the role of the virus, in fact, if you just looked at the end-stage renal disease database, there was this rapid increase in the number of HIV-positive patients uh, with end-stage renal disease until the late 90s and 2000 when, of course, antiretroviral therapy was starting to be widely utilized and, again, really supporting the direct role of the virus. And so there never was or never will be a clinical trial. Um, there was such strong preclinical evidence. There was such very convincing um, epidemiology that, in fact, in 2005 and 2007, in this country, guidelines changed so that any evidence of HIV-associated uh, renal disease is an indication for therapy, whether there's, low, there's high CD4s or low viral load. Um, this isn't the case worldwide, which, which may be a problem. Anyway, we were very interested in defining what that virus looked like in the kidney, since it wasn't the, the virus isn't using a standard co-receptor. What does the virus look like? So uh, Daniel Maris in the lab used um, looked specifically at renal epithelial cells using laser capture and isolated a DNA amplified uh, HIV envelope sequences from those renal tubule epithelial cells as well as PBMCs. Um, that were isolated at the same time, and he found that the renal sequences subclustered in the kidney off of the PBMCs, suggesting that there's a divergence and local HIV replication within the kidney, and that there's tissue-specific evolution supporting the kidney as a unique compartment for HIV. And again, really got us thinking about, is this going to be a problem with the kidney being a long-term, not only a compartment, but what we call a reservoir? That is a site that can lead to reactivation and then seeding systemically in the, in the um, event of antiretroviral therapy or stopping antiretroviral therapy, or even as we think of cure initiatives. So we want to, you can't go and do serial renal biopsies to really understand this compartment and what happens over time. So we wanted to be able to, to look at the virus um, from the kidney indirectly, and obvious source would be the urine. Um, and lately, we have had quite a bit of success in doing single genome amplification and looking at the virus in the urine to see if it does indeed represent a separate compartment. And when we do that and you look at virus sequences derived from PBMCs, and viral sequences derived from urine, you see that this is a branch point off of the PBMC, and again suggesting these sets of virus are coming from a separate compartment distinct from the PBMCs, and now what we are going back in and doing is then looking at simultaneously derived biopsies to see if this indeed is, does represent very accurately virus in the kidney to be able to study this evolution over time. <clears throat> 
But we're still left with, well, how does the virus get in? And this was really um, developed by Ben Chen, one of our collaborators on the program project grant who worked with us. He developed um, green labeled virus by making a capsid chimeric uh, virus with GFP and labeling both renal tubal epithelial cells and CD4 cells doing a co-culture system and able to show when you allow direct contact be inf between infected T cells and renal tubal epithelial cells, you get massive transfer of virus into the epithelial cells. This does require direct contact. What's kind of interesting, this is really nice showing the virus particles. He's got time-lapse photography, really being able to show the virus as it marches from the T cell to the epithelial cell. Um, what's very interesting about this is it's not envelope dependent. So again, it has nothing to do with the classic entry um, that we know of HIV with CD4. And we are still looking at what constitutes that uh, synapse between the T cell and the epithelial cell. Um, cell associated infection is dramatically more efficient than trying to load the cell with cell free virus. In fact, it's very hard to get cell free virus in these cells. And, and that's true of a T cell infection as well. We now know that a T cell T cell synapse is a much more efficient way to spread virus than cell free virus. We also know um, in subsequent work uh, with Maria Blasi in my lab at Duke that once the virus gets in the cell, in cells that have high GFP expression, there's full reverse transcription that's blocked by AZT, and then there's integration uh, as shown by ALU PCR. So again, that is a, a concern because here is a site, non-traditional immune cell, where you have integrated um, provirus. Renal epithelial cells have a very long half-life. So as we start to think about strategies to rid the body of infected cells, this will be a site that we will really have to understand in terms of how the virus actually is reactivated and how we might clear those infected cells. And this just to show you once the cell is, in, is indeed infected, that you can isolate these cells in culture and show that they do make infectious virus. And in fact, in kind of completing the story, if you co-cult the renal tube epithelial cells back with T cells, you get very efficient transfer back to the T cell. And so what we think is, is happening in the absence of antiretroviral therapy is you get a T cell uh, epithelial cell synapse virus is transferred into the epithelial cell. The epithelial cell can support full integration. We think you get cell cell spread, although we haven't proven that yet. And when these cells make virus, they can pass it back out to an uninfected T cell. And then we also know through work done by Mike Ross a couple of years ago and more recently in an expanded RNA-seq approach that when you cultivate an infected T cell in a renal tubal epithelial cell and get virus transfer, you get really dramatic increase in chemokines and, and pro-inflammatory cytokines, which probably just fuels this whole process. In the presence of antiretroviral therapy, this arm is blocked, but we certainly worry about the fact that stress or other um, other attempts to actually activate the virus peripherally as part of a cure phenomenon will activate the virus in the kidney, and we really need to understand this process. Very interesting paper came out recently in a series of transplant patients. Um, transplantation is done on HIV positive patients. One of the, the requirements of going into transplant is they have to be completely virally suppressed. So all of these patients in this series from France went into transplantation with no evidence of, of plasma virus, and yet they reported a significant number, I think it was 19 or so patients, that post-transplant biopsies, they were able to show in a very similar distribution to what we've shown that you have virus in renal tubal epithelial cells and podocytes. So how does it get there? Again, this is a hypothesis. We think that certainly those patients we, at, we know have a certain reservoir of quiescent or latently infected T cells, most likely in the process of, of recognizing the, the graft, they actually are activated and in the, the opportunity to come in contact with an epithelial cell transfer the virus. And in fact, that this group has been able to show that this may be partially responsible what's, to what's been observed as a higher rate of acute, eject, acute rejection, although long term the patients do quite well. So why is HIVAN a disease of patients uh, only of African descent? 
Well, we had shown that if you breed the transgene in, in different um, murine backgrounds, they certainly have high and low penetrance of the disease, and in fact, there are risk loci and protective loci, but the real story came from human studies. And this has been a remarkable story um, and has, has now been duplicated in a number of studies that basically showing that whether it's FSGS, it's high van, hypertension, or now sickle cell disease, they are all related to two APOL1 missense uh, allele variants that really have a strong association with these diseases. And in fact, in high van, 24-fold increased risk. Um, these alleles are found G1 in Western Africa, G2 throughout Africa. Why were they maintained in the population? This is not my work, but it's a great story. We think because it confers resistance to African sleeping sickness, which is really very similar if you think about um, sickle cell disease. But what we don't know is why does the, these missense uh, mutations really pre predispose to renal disease? What's known about ApoL1, it's certainly part of the autophagy pathway, but nobody's been able to really demonstrate what's the direct connection back to being the predisposing factor to such a broad array of kidney disease. And I think this is really the, one of the hot questions um, in, in uh, nephrology currently. Changing spectrum of renal disease. Well, what happened when, when antiretroviral therapy started is we saw a dramatic decrease in high van as manifested certainly by some biopsy series. So this one out of Hopkins in 1997, if you looked at all biopsies from HIV positive patients, 80% were high van. 2004, only 20% high van. But we haven't seen a fall in chronic kidney disease in the setting of HIV. Why? Well, we think what we've seen is a change in the disease. So now we have increased uh, reports of a non-collapsing FSGS variant, which we're speculating is HIV, but also a marked increase in other chronic kidney diseases. And this is a theme throughout HIV work right now, that it appears that HIV either accelerates diseases of aging or actually increases the incidence of diseases of aging, certainly seen in a lot of epidemiology data in cardiovascular disease, in bone disease, in liver disease, and in renal disease. And in fact, Christina Wyatt, um, completed a study with the VA cohort to show very nicely the coexistence of HIV and diabetes led to a 4.4 hazard ratio for progression compared to a 2.4 and a 2.8 when you had either alone. So clearly suggesting there is an interaction between HIV and a very important chronic kidney disease, that's diabetes. So of course, CJ went back to the mouse model and he could show this interaction very nicely in the, in the TG26 HIV model, uh, a, a diabetes, you can see that having the transgene markedly aggravates diabetic nephropathy. And when you went, look at why some of the markers certainly show a very broad increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines, gets to this overlying hypothesis that the reason you have accelerated um, chronic disease, particularly cardiovascular, in the setting of HIV, even though it's completely controlled, is there's this underlying chronic inflammation. Lots of stories about why that might be. It's not part of my work, but um, a, an area of very general interest in the HIV field, which is understanding how HIV aggravates aging. Currently, our major areas of focus are two very relevant areas to HIV. One is as we very, very cautiously talk about cure as a scientific endeavor, not as a clinical endeavor currently, we need to understand these viral reservoirs, how the virus is reactivated, and if the virus is reactivated, does that kill the cell? And the kidney is going to be very unique in that regard. And the other thing is certainly understanding the interaction between an aging HIV population and comorbidities, including renal disease. And with that, I'll stop and just really uh, recognize my collaborators in part of this has all been a, a real team effort. Certainly, Paul Klotman, who is the PP, the, he's the PI of this longstanding PPG, Lewis Kaufman, Si Zhang He, and Ravi Iyengar, who really pushed the REV project, Mice Ross, the genetic predisposition, Ben Chen and Ping Chen, the cell cell transfer, Christina Wyatt, the clinical core. Vivette Degati at Columbia, the Pathology Corps, Debbie Hink, our Animal Corps, Ali Garavi, who's worked on the murine genetics, and my laboratory members at Duke.
Thank you.